Hey, 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 what's up, everybody? Welcome to episode number 61 of the White Knuckle Podcast, powered by Ozonics. Undetectable, undeniable. Thanks for tuning back in to the White Knuckle Podcast, episode number 51. Today we have a guest in Kevin Boyer from Real World Wildlife Products that is an absolute wealth of knowledge when it comes to food plots and anything related to deer hunting or land management and, and all that good stuff. So we had a ton of feedback from our first show with Kevin where it was just a, a kind of get to know you show. And today's show is going to be about food plots. And um, he's going to get intricate on a few details with respect to soybeans and some other things like that. Um, I hope you enjoy the show. We certainly enjoyed putting it on. I know I say that all the time, but it's the truth. Uh, Kevin's a ton of a ton of fun to have just because I always walk away having learned something. So with that, here is none other than Mr. Kevin Boyer. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome back to the White Knuckle Podcast today. Of course, I have joined with me my co-host, Todd Pringitz, via Skype on the other line. Todd, how's everything down in Iowa? It's uh, it's gloomy there, uh, Jason. It's been kind of rainy. Uh, it's pretty wet, a little bit mushy, a uh, little wet. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a little wet here too. <laughs> uh. Well, we've been um, we've been talking about uh, getting Kevin Boyer from uh, Real World Wildlife uh, Products and Seed and whatever else they uh, make, which I'm sure they've got some other uh, cookies coming for us. But um, the last show we did with Kevin was one of our big hits. We had a lot of feedback, a lot of questions. Um, and just talking with a few of my buddies who listened, uh, like Tyler Tissue and some some different team members, everybody really had something to say about it. They were um, intrigued about the depth and the discussion about beans we had and all the other the, the different things um, that you guys have put into, you know, what you do, which is, in our opinion, make the best seat around for for whitetails. So welcome back to the show, Kevin. We're happy to have you here, buddy. Hey, I'm glad to be part of it. So. Well, I guess, hey, let's get right into it, man. I, I posted a couple a uh, couple po- uh, posts on our uh, Facebook page, uh, my, my own personal page, um, mentioning that we were going to have you on the show. And I got quite a few questions uh, just since this morning. So what I want to do is um, make sure that we can get to some of these questions from our uh, audience. Uh, and so basically... What um, what the first question I have here is in regard to if you were uh, if you had a farm uh, that was that had uh, beans and corn planted in agriculture all around you, what would you plant? I would still plant beans because even though the ag fields around you uh, kind of take care of the feeding issues during the summertime, once the crops are harvested from the farmers, you know the deer will pick over those grains laying in the field for a little while, but you know, as a food plotter, we got to think more than just hunting season. It's not just we're setting a food plot to draw the deer in and keep them around that area for, you know, harvesting them. But, you know, to me, the, the more thing, the better thing to look at as a food plotter is what are they eating right now? So <clears throat> if you're just relying on the farmer's corn and bean fields, a lot of those have been picked over by now. And it's looking at our food plots and addressing them as today. You know, what are what did our deer have to eat? from the end of season, from the end of January, until we start planting again in the 1st of May, what's left. So if we, if we got some corn and some beans left, you know, that the farmers do plant those, but if we plant the big plant fields in our food plots and leave those for the animals to eat, we can get a lot of good nutrients out of it. They just save them from losing some muscle structure when they're, the feeding is the, the most critical time, which is right about now. Uh, the, I'll just, so I, I have some. I have something to add to it too. I, the one thing I do, uh, Kevin, and I'm, I've heard it talked about before, but when all my guys around here, uh, all my big farmers are planting their beans, I always wait two, three weeks after the main bean planting, just because 
I'm not too I'm not as concerned about yield as far as bean yield, but what I am more concerned about is trying to hold some of those green leaves into the early season here in Iowa. And I'll tell you, over the years in early October, and they usually won't go much into October, but even a week into October, if you have some green beans still standing, those bucks will move in on that because it's just that food source has has is no longer exists anywhere but potentially on your farm. So I also stagger mine. And if I'm planting more than one bean uh, bean field or any ag for that matter, I try to stagger mine on my own farm just so that there's always something of a little bit different palate and texture um, and taste on my farm at any given time. Yeah, that's that's an excellent point, and that's one thing we try to, to stress to guys planting, especially your smaller plots when you're only planting you know half acre or an acre of beans. If the deer find those first and there's nothing else growing, they'll come in. You'll have a lot of browse pressure. But uh, what you touched on there, planting them a few weeks later, is a good point. Uh, I'll tell you a few things I'm running into right now is I've met with a couple uh, uh, people on their farms looking and addressing some soybean issues they've had and talking about varieties. You know, one thing to look at is the ag bean. When they're planting an ag bean, it's one variety. And in most areas, you know, here where I live in central Illinois and, and maybe even where you guys are in Iowa, most of these farmers are planting a group number three, three, five, or maybe a three, nine, close to a four. So, and what that is, a group number is how long the beans grow and mature, you know, to, to where they dry down and they're ready to be harvested. So, as we look at a, a higher group number or longer maturity, we can only go so long and then we start affecting the, the pod production. So, farmers know what they need for pod production and for a yield, and they're looking at about, like I say, a three to a three nine, maybe a four bean, and it's one bean. So when, when that plant drops its leaves or dries out, it happens all at once. Where one of the things we did with our blend of real world soybeans is we got four varieties in there, and they dry down at different stages. So we're at a four zero, four two, four eight, and a five zero on our group numbers, and what that allows us to do is it allows those beans to actually grow and stay green a little bit longer into October, maybe even up into November, where sometimes we're getting our frost, you know, middle of November. A lot of those beans in our blend, they'll grow to mature enough that the pods and the bean seeds mature and, and get rounded inside the pods, and they've lost their moisture. So that's what keeps them through the winter time where they're a good food source. But that blend of four beans tries to keep as long as you can on the green leaf stage where if you grow longer than uh, you know a group five if you start looking at six sevens and eights that's more like a forage bean where you're kind of giving up pod production for green leaves and what happens is is once they frost you know the green leaves are done so uh that's that's a good point on you know planting them a little bit later to have some green leaves and also if you're using a different group number a little bit higher that'll give you a little bit longer growing season as well yeah, while we're, while we're on the topic of beans, because that was definitely one of the major uh, hot points that guys were asking questions about. One one guy just mentioned, he said uh, on Facebook, he wanted to know why why real-world beans were considerably more expensive than a typical um, a typical Pioneer bean or DeKalb or whatever. I think I already know the answer to that, but Kevin, would you address that? I don't even know, honestly, what a bag of regular beans ag beans goes for compared to like a real world but uh, considering the volume that these big companies produce i can imagine you know volume and then also the variety but would you mind commenting about that yeah well i mean the difference is when you're looking at a, an ag bean to plant as a farmer you know it might be from 35 dollars to 45 or 50 bucks depending on the genetic trade or maybe even a little bit higher than that so you know, our real world beans, we sell those for $75 a bag, which, you know, you're looking at $20, $25 higher. The one thing about it is, is if you're planting beans, I mean, we we tested, there's over 40,000 bean varieties, and they're picked on different, you know, traits in those beans, whether some of them are better for growing pods in a drier conditions or wetter conditions or higher oil, higher fat content, you know, uh, more of a forage or, or an ag bean, you know, there's a lot of different traits in those. So, we tested a little over 300 to 316 varieties, I think is what it was. But that our beans were based on first on the highest shadow resistant bean. So when you buy an ag bean, that says maybe a shadow resistant of one, which is good, a good shadow resistant bean. It's it's rated for October, November, not shattered open that time of the year. 
Well, we tested, we put utilization cages on all the beans we tested for March, April, May of the following year. Because even though you get through October and November, you still need that food source for December, January, February, March, April. So some ag beans that were tested as a one, great for farmers for shadow resistant, there's no other test being done to prove shadow resistant ability for us as food plotters, except for what we've done or what I'm aware of that tests for later in the year. So some of the ag beans that was a, a tested one shadow resistant was not a good fit for us as a food plotter because even though they kept the beans in the pod early in hunting season, they failed us in the late season. That's part of it. The other thing is, is with four varieties, you know, it, you'd have to buy four bags of beans to mix one and you'd have to come up with the right varieties. Now, you know, a, a lot of people can say, well, we can just pick any four soybeans they are all the same. But I will tell you right now, one of the guys I met with this, uh, Oh, probably two or three weeks ago, and he filmed it. It'll probably be on his show, but uh, actually he planted 30 acres of beans, and the deer just did not eat them this year. And he was scratching his head about he never thought deer would not eat a soybean. He just didn't know what the issue was. Last year, he planted soybeans. There would be 30 to 70 deer in the plots. This year, there was just a couple deer come in and feed a few minutes and leave. The buck he was targeting this year was actually shot on his neighbor's farm, was not shot on his. And my question to him was this, was what kind of soybeans did you plant? And his answer was he wasn't for sure. He got them at the co-op and just planted whatever they had at the co-op. And I said, well, what beans did you plant last year? And he goes, just whatever beans the co-op had. <laughs> and I said, do you, do you think they're the same? I said, do you think they're the same beans? And he goes, there's no way they were the same beans. But I told him I've seen in the past with our testing that there are some beans, and, and people won't realize this until they see a complete failure like this guy did, that they don't realize there are some beans on green leaves when you plant them side by side with others that the deer will go to one variety over another and eat them, whether they're higher in oil, higher in fat, whatever makes them taste better. It's a taste thing. And the same way with these beans that were dried down, wintertime, snow on the ground, he had corn, he had beans, he had other products around there in the year before and all the years past. He couldn't drive the deer out of the field. But for this year, the deer did not like the taste of them at all. So he's seen a difference. And that's the thing about planting one variety of anything, whether it's a purple top turnip or, you know, a soybean or whatever. When you're planting one variety, it's hit or miss. And if you pick the right one, it works fine for you. Well, good. But when you pick the wrong one, like this guy, and you're counting on harvesting that deer that you let go for three or four years, and all of a sudden you picked a variety that year he doesn't like, then somebody else gets to take him to the taxidermist. Uh, I would so there, say one thing right, right now, Kevin, especially when you're talking cost of food plots, overall beans are cheap, even considering a more expensive real world bean compared to, you know, an ag bean. But to me, uh, a $75 bag of beans will plant an acre. Now, once you, you see the growth that you get with your beans, so long as you do the proper, uh, take the proper steps and, and controlling your weeds and, and fertilizing and whatnot, uh, doing your soil tests, uh, by comparison to anything else, it's still cheap. Um, and I'll tell you, an acre of beans will go a long way. So it, generally, it's not something you're planting 20, 30 acres unless you're just an absolute nut, nut job on huge, huge amounts of property. So for the average guy, myself included, I might have a total of maybe five acres of beans each season. And then I try to have some corn and then of course my other green plots and stuff. So it, it's not like you're going to be spending thousands of dollars on, on bean seed. And that's the attractiveness. And a lot of the questions we got uh, about beans were uh, based on our last conversation when, when we kind of went through, I kind of touched on that. I, I, I plant my beans by just, uh, by just uh, top seeding and literally have been doing it with my ATV. I don't have a seed or anything. And of all the plants I, uh, of all the seeds I plant each year, beans are the easiest. I mean, and that's what I think there's some misconception that, uh, that maybe comes from corn because corn is a pain in the neck to, to get to grow properly and it's very expensive. But uh, soybeans are really easy. And just, I'm going to take you through my little uh, scenario. I typically, I use a, a Coons Engineering a ATV uh, tiller, which is basically just a small plow. And I basically... We'll, we'll start off by uh, by applying some sort of a weed killer, usually a week to two weeks in advance, let everything brown up. I have everything mowed down as low as I can when I do that. Um, and I till everything up, get it to the point where it's really, really broken up 
really, really well. Um, and, and then I, I basically will just do a very light till job just to create a little bit of a furrow or just some, you know, uh, chunks and and it's not perfect it's not perfect rows by any means uh but just to disrupt the surface so it's kind of kind of bumpy a little bit um then i i throw my my beans on top uh i usually will plant about 15 to 20 percent more than uh required if you're just doing a broadcast application because with a cedar you're guaranteed to get you know the perfect every seed's going to most likely grow uh when you're top seeding you know birds will eat some of them some of them won't just thrive because they're sitting on top of the, the soil they won't get compacted in so i always do about 20 percent more than required um for that reason and then once the beat the the beans are on top of the soil i'll go back with my coons tiller and i'll just put it down just barely an inch or two just to kind of mix them in with the soil um then my final step is i call to pack it uh, i have a coons call to packer but you can use a water one or whatever but that call to pack process seems to really do a big difference but what I've noticed, Kevin, which is awesome, is when I get done, I'll go look at it and you can see some beans on top of the surface. And then as they start to grow, I really am anal because if you're like me, you know, you want to see exactly what your your seed distribution is, what your growth rate is. You, I'm just getting anal. I want to see what's happening. And 90 percent, I would guess, of all the seeds that are laying on top end up growing and turning into beans. Uh, I mean, you can literally see them start to sprout. They get the roots in the ground. And um, and for deer plots. I mean, to me, that's what matters. And I know the difference at the end of the year, this time of year, I just mowed a few weeks ago, all my beans down. And dude, I mean, I had so many beans left still in the pods, still standing two and a half, three feet off the ground. And it is into March. So you may pay a little bit more for real world beans, but come March, you're going to know what the difference is. And you're going to basically have more, a higher percentage of food still standing in the pods. And so that's where your money goes. Well, you're, you're exactly right, and especially what you touched on there, like corn and beans. You know, corn's five times the cost of beans, and corn they're going to eat on the grains late season, but, you know, beans from the time that plant comes up in the green leaf stage, you know, if you're planting them mid-May or 1st of June, they're eating them from the time they're in green leaves, and they can eat them all year long. As long as you've got plenty of pods, they'll be eating them next year when you're ready to plant again. So it's really a – beans are, are less cost to, to plant. And it actually can be a 12-month feeding program from the time they sprout if you have enough acreage to plant them, you know, to have plenty in the pods when it gets to be the next year to, to disc them under and start again. So it's it's really yeah. one of the, like you say, the easier and the best food source you bet. year round. Well, the, the other thing I've noticed here in my farm, because I'm not doing huge, huge acreage, um, when I planted corn in the past in smaller sections, they just completely destroy it before it even ha- really even has a chance to grow they absolutely just love that soft green. Um, oh, I don't, you know, the, uh, I'm not a farmer by any means, but, um, Clear, you know, when they clearly. first start, <laughs> but, but what, what they end up doing on my farm is in small sections, they'll just come and start eating the tops of those ears off when they're, uh, getting all that nice little, that little, uh, can you help me nope. here, Kevin? <laughs> help, yeah. help, help him out. Okay. So yeah, they're, what, they're eating the silks off and the raccoons are hitting us off corn too and they devour a lot of that before it even gets to be crop so like i end up with like literally um i mean i've had points where unless you're going to plant probably i'd say th- two to three acres minimum of corn it's really not even worth planting because it's going to be gone if you have any sort of browse and the one thing i've noticed about my beans what i love about it is even if they get browsed heavy in the summertime they still produce pods and you still have standing beans and you have a long late season food source with it, where with corn, if they start eating that, those cobs when they're growing in the green process, that's good. That's done. That's no longer a food source. Yeah. It'll be gone. It, it basically just turns a standing brush, you know, in the season. And, you know, that's one thing about corn that you do get a little bit of cover with it. But but again, for for most of the guys with the questions, you could definitely tell they're they're looking at more smaller time, uh, smaller farm operations slash you know hunting properties these are hunting plot guys so uh beans are are so much easier from that standpoint and obviously you have all the the ag equipment to plant them properly you're going to see even better results but i'd say for a majority you know guys that's what makes real world beans so attractive is that you can plant them and 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 experience really good results with a minimal amount of uh cost and a minimal amount of equipment yeah, and, and like you were saying in the beginning about those plots, you know, I, I like to take a plot and put a little bit of clover around the edge, have a little bit of diversity in in your plot. So 
you know, do a 10 or 20 foot strip of clover around the edge, do your beans out in the middle, and then you can always overseed or, or if you have a heavy area that gets browsed, you can go in there with, uh, you know, any of the fall products, the plot toppers, the oats and stuff. But, you know, I like to see greens and grains in the same field. So when you can do that, you've got something when it warms up from the come of the greens and something when it really gets cold, cold, you know, they like the grains. So I've got a question from um, a Facebook viewer or listener, whatever you want to call them. Um, I, while you guys were talking there, I just went live and asked people to ask some questions. Uh, I just got an email in um, and the question is on limited amounts of property with limited amounts of cover in ag country, yeah, in, in, in ag country, are you more, um, are you doing yourself more of a favor by planting cover than you are food? And I'm guessing when they're talking about cover, they're talking about your bedding in a bag or something like that. So let's, let's say for, for, um, this conversation's sake, um, you've got an opportunity to, to plant a two acre food plot or two acres of cover um, in in this particular area. And let's assume that there's a significant amount of ag in that area. What, what in your opinion, from a, um, a land manager standpoint and also a seed guy standpoint, a food plot guy standpoint, what, uh, what do you think is better? Well, I mean, it depends on pressure on the property too, because I will tell you this much, you know, cover, good thick cover where deer spends his 90% of his time is a key. You can't keep a deer on your property. If you had 10 acres of food and 10 acres of cover, you, you know, the 10 acres of food is going to feed a lot of deer, but they can feed in, in there at night. So if you just got a couple acres, I mean, I'd like to see uh, a bedding area set up to be, you know, two, three, four acres or so. But if a guy can do a little clover strip around the edge, do some good bedding cover um, and watch his pressure, he can improve his property, a small acreage. He can prove the property quicker by having good thick cover for deer to bed in, meaning the does and bucks and everything can bed in there. If he has a two acre wide open field, he'll draw deer in. But in big ag areas, you know, deer can travel for miles at night and find food source in a big ag area usually. So, you know, I mean, just going on a rule of thumb, if you're trying to kill, you know, a bigger deer or more mature deer, cover is key to them, you know, and, and it has to be a true sanctuary. If you've got cover, and you've got dogs and, and everybody's, you know, walking through it and running through it, then you might as well do a food plot. But if you can set up a true two or three or four acre sanctuary of bedding grasses, a different type of product other than the woods that they can identify with. And that's the key to, to the grasses is, you know, deer stand in the corn and stay in the corn late season when the, when the ground's wet and the farmers can't get the corn out because they've identified over years that that corn's safety and they can tell a difference between that and the woods. And that's what your grasses will do. So I would say, depending on the pressure, but probably on a two or three acre patch, you're probably better off doing uh, bedding grasses of some sort and clover around the edge, which will give you a little bit of food source there. And, and it give you a way to control your grasses and do a burn. We'll get more deer to stay in on your property or moving through it. So it sounds to me like what you're saying is that um, the big, the big question mark isn't, um, really whether you do one or the other, it's a pretty easy answer. The, 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 the bigger question that you're, it sounds like you're needing to ask is how much pressure is there in, in, is that two to three acres going to have, you know, people, dogs, whatever around it, um, thus rendering it really useless is what you're saying. Is that correct? Yeah. If you got, if you got a small property and I've, I've been to somewhere, you know, the, the area they've got to set up is on the back side of a 20 acre uh, piece of woods they own where it's in the middle of a wide open field, well, that would be better suited for a sanctuary or you could do food back there. But, you know, if it's if the 20 acres you got and the two acres you're looking about doing is right off your, your yard, right by your house, where, you know, you're outside with cookouts and you got dogs and everything else, then instead of doing cover there where, you know, the animals aren't going to feel a safe bedding there, you may be better off doing food source there because they'll come up at night and feed there. You'll keep them coming to that area. You just have to time it, you know, when the rut's on and trying to time just a certain certain days to hunt it with only the right winds. And, you, and, you know, you can enjoy them seeing them coming out in the food there from the house and stuff, where if you have a, try to build a sanctuary right next to, you know, where the dogs are going to be running or where people are going to be or a lot of human scent, that's not going to be a true sanctuary. Yeah, uh, that, that makes I, complete sense to me. 
I, I've got a, a, something to add to, and this is going to go into our next, uh, our next. Uh, I was going to say customer question, but I guess hopefully they will turn into customers for uh, for all of us, but uh, and all of our sponsors. But um, one thing I want to comment too is I think a lot of guys really concentrate on amount of acreage they plant. And the one thing I know after uh, you and uh, Don came to my place for for two seasons, I went food plot completely crazy and basically cut every every uh, CRP field I had planted food everywhere and and just went bananas and and you know kind of the old adage of more is better. So now the last few years, what I've really started to focus in on is creating kill spots. And being able to create as many of those as humanly as humanly possible for different different hunts, different wind conditions, and different times of the year. So let me put it in this way: instead of having one ten acre field of solid food, I'd rather like what Kevin's saying is find a way to to get two different setups out of it. You know, create one little spot in the back corner for a northwest wind, maybe one that's a little bit easier to get to for a south wind that would you would be more likely hunting in the early season. Um, but try to diversify your property so that you can get more bang for your buck as far as number of hunts per year out of your out of your property. Um, and so now all my kill plots, because I'm a bow hunter, so all my kill plots are probably about three quarters of an acre, uh, half to three quarters of an acre. Then I I always have those smaller plots adjacent right to that thick cover because during the rut, man, that's all you need. You just need a green plot. Hopefully you got some beans and corn around it and or any any sort of cover but what happens is the does move into those those thickets and with the food being right there adjacent there will be a big mature buck that will move in for the rut and be and be calling that area home or at least wanting to control it so if i can create three or four or five or ten of those same scenarios on my farm that's the goal uh it gives you ten different options or three different options or five different options uh and then you got you can spread yourself out, create more opportunities, and not burn your property up so quickly. So that's one of my tips. But um, Kevin, one of the questions is about if if you were to have ten acres of food that you were going to plant on your farm, what would how would you break it up? If you were going to plant beans, any type of a, a grain of some sort, and then your different your green plots, what what type of a ratio or percentage would you apply for each different type of food? Kevin, you didn't well, know I mean, we we were going to get so technical on you, did you? Oh yeah, yeah. I knew you guys were going to come on here sooner or later. So, yeah. <laughs> now, what I would do is probably look at the deer numbers and know that okay, if I plant four acres of beans, is that enough to get me through up until you know this time of year a little bit later? So if it wasn't, I might increase that to six. But like I say, in most of my setups, I'm always looking for a certain amount of clover chicory. Because that's something that, that even though it doesn't grow much in the snow or in the late winter time, they'll still eat it. I've seen them dig through the snow and eat the clover and chicory, you know, in January, February, and March. And it's it's something that grow a lot of tonnage. And there's certain times of the year where they really like it. So I always do a certain amount of clover chicory. I like to do that around the edge of the woods. It's a product that'll go close to the trees. It stay it's a low product, so the deer are a little bit easier to make for scrapes and rubs and travel the edges. The other thing I'm looking about when I'm laying out uh, food plots is trying to create edges in there. A reason for a deer to travel on the edge of a food source, kind of like they would where a corn and bean field meet up and they come down those edges, you'll see a path where deer travel those edges. So in my food plots, I might do clover all the way around the edge of the fields, around the timber. And then so far out, I may do uh, like a strip of harvest salad, you know, a little strip of harvest salad, maybe only 20 or 30 yards. And then I'll do beans out in the middle, and then right in the middle of the beans, I might do my brassicas. And it kind of depends on, you know, for like some of us that are just bow hunters, we got to look about our scenarios close range. And for a guy that bow hunts and gun hunts, you know, he knows later in the season, if he's a muzzleloader hunter, he can have his brassicas set out there in the middle of the field at 50 and 75 yards. And that's perfect for him for late season. And he can try to use the other products based on, their attractability or the palatability of them and when the deer are hitting the most on for his early season so he can plant those closer but i mean it gets down to you know i would say four to six acres of beans uh looking about an acre or so of either the brassicas or uh maybe an acre or so of like a harvest salad which is like your wheat oats australian peas something like that a green product that grows really good in the fall so you've got greens and grains uh, both in the same time. Your Australian peas are kind of like a wintertime soybean. And then a little clover chicory around the edge. 
And the reason why I leave the corn out is like we talked earlier, you know, it's five times the cost. Most guys won't put a hydrus down to really get grain production. You get the guys that start planting, you know, 20 acres or 15, 20 acre food plots. Those guys have probably got access to the equipment or a farmer that, you know, can plant five acres or so of corn for them to kind of split up some of the grains and do a good job of it. But I mean, if that, if that kind of answers the question, you know, four to six acres of beans and the rest, the rest would be a kind of a diversity of fall greens and spring, you know, clover, some products like that. Uh, One other thing I've noticed on my property, and just like what what Kevin's talking about is like you go to shed season, you get to the point in spring, if you still have uh, standing beans left that you know, okay, this got me through this year and then next, you know, the next following year, you can tweak or or go back or um, don't not plant quite as many if you had access or increase the amount based on if you got completely wiped out and you didn't find any sheds or whatever. So, and that's with this farming stuff. You learn so much every year, each year you, you tweak your plans, you make adjustments and you adapt. But uh, the one thing I did on my farm, I have access all the way around the outside of my farm. And I created, uh, I've kind of got a, a big cedar area, which I'm continuing to work on, but clover is a really durable plant that you can drive on. You don't want to be driving on it every day, but for me, in order to access some of my inner inner fields, uh, both for farming and, you know, to check trail cameras, whether I'm working out there in the summer or whatever, clover is really durable. So you can drive on it and it still will come right back and it'll keep growing. You just got to be able to mow it. That's the one thing with clover. If you're planting clover and you want it to look beautiful and green like you see on TV, then you're going to want to have it mowed, you know, several times throughout the season. So you got to have an ability to mow it. But but other than that, dude, this stuff grows back year after year. So it's a it's an annual for, I think, four or five years, isn't it, Kevin? Yeah, I mean, it just depends on, I mean, when we're addressing uh, this time of year, looking at our clover plots, you know, if you're adding a little bit of seed every year, I've had them last eight years or longer. But, you know, if you're always frost seeding a little bit in there to fill in those berries, you're putting in fresh seed every year. You maintain your grasses and do your mowing, you can just keep frost seeding and, and it'll keep growing for several years. But I've had them eight or nine years still do fine. And I, I mean, I don't spray mine. I, I just let them go. And, you know, the big thing is I don't really care if there's a little bit of weeds here and there. If um, if I've got, you know, the, the nutritional value, the deer certainly don't care. So like from the maintenance standpoint, it's really easy. Clover is super easy to plant. Oh, yeah. Most guys can do it. And you can do it in small sections. It's very tolerant to shade. It's tolerant to, to sun. Uh, so long as you get rain, clover grows pretty simple. And then uh, I do all of my all my green plots pretty much deadly dozen, but I like to have, you know, that one killer plot in each one of those little spots. Um, and now I've started reducing and eliminating certain plots because I just don't want them to have the options. I, you know, if I've got one corridor of, let's say, you know, five acres, eight acres of a section of property, and I know where I need to hunt and all that, I only really want them feeding primarily on that green plot in one area. So that's where I'll like tweak my setups each year. And I mean, it's, it's never ending and it's always evolving. Um, but the big thing is you just basically got to take the dive, get your feet wet and don't be afraid to make mistakes. Cause we make, I make mistakes every year, but I kind of look at it from a learning standpoint and, you know, each year they just get better and better. And I learn how to, uh, become more efficient too. It's not just about throwing more seed on the ground and more chemicals and more fertilizer. It's about being smart with it, making your money go as far as you possibly can and, you know, not throwing it out, uh, and wasting it in, in ways that you just don't need to. What, one thing I look at this time of year is, uh, I mean, kind of what I'm doing right now is I'm looking at my food plots that, you know, address them and look at them. Were they a success this year? Did the deer feed in them and why didn't they or why did they? And I, I can say right now I'm getting a lot of people sending me pictures and stuff wanting to know, you know, why they're not eating this or that. And one guy sent me a picture of a bunch of beans that they weren't eating. And when he cracked the pods open, the bean seeds themselves were egg shaped is what they are. And what that told me was is the variety that he planted did not have enough time to mature and turn around and lose the moisture in the bean seed so they they actually had actually started to grow mold or fungus in there which affects the taste so you know i'm, I'm just looking at everything but guys can look at their one thing i'm doing is looking at my plots address them saying what can i do better did i run out of beans when did i run out of beans can i make it bigger with beans if not do i need to add more clover what can i add in those areas you know to, to see what was what it was and, and then also i'm addressing you know like my clover plots when I'm looking at them and they've been pretty well mowed down. Is there a lot of bare area? How much frost seeding do I need to do? And it's still, you know, people say, well, the ground's not frozen. We're not getting snow. Frost seeding's over. We're getting plenty of moisture right now. If you if you got some thin areas, you can still broadcast seed in there in your clover plots. 
or uh, for guys that have like the switchgrass areas where they prepared the areas to be put in switchgrass, if they didn't get the seed down earlier, you know, they can still get it put in there. But the thing about it is the plots need to really be clear to, to put that in there. But I'm always telling people, you know, every, every month and every few weeks, there's something you can do on your property. If you just look at an address about what changes can you make and what worked for you and what didn't work for you, or, you know, the deer come out of a certain place on the food plot. I don't need them to come out there. I need them to come closer. Do I hinge cut a couple of trees in that area to make them fun a little bit closer to my stand site? You know, always addressing and tweaking, like you say, to try to improve your next year's hunting situations for your success. So, the, so essentially what you're saying is, is the food plot, I guess I, I never really thought about it that way. The food plot is, is, you know, certainly part of the equation, a big part of the equation. They got to want to eat it. But once you get them to want to eat it, um, you can then begin to manipulate things like, you know, hinge cutting and, and, you know, there's a hundred different things that you can do to get them to funnel by you, um, where you, where you need them to. Yeah. Yeah. But it's picking out the, the first thing is, you know, picking the stand side or picking a hunting blind or your entrance and exit route dictate where those should be. And then from there, you know, and it may not be on the plot, it may be back in the woods and even back in there, you know, if, as a bow hunter, if they're traveling from you at 50 yards every day, you know, for me, I like to have them at 20 to 30 yards. So if they're traveling 50 yards on the edge of a ridge there or something or a saddle, and that's where they've traveled a long time, but I can hinge cut, you know, a half a dozen trees on that farm if it's my farm and I can get them to, you know, come around up towards me, cut them at an angle and drop them at a particular angle. Or even just I've taken uh, on a place where they went out by one of my stands, it was a uh, cattle pasture next to me, and they actually were quartering towards me all the way out to the field. And it just was a low percentage shot. You know, you couldn't shoot them, and then they'd be out in the field, and they'd get, get by you too quick. So um, me and my brother one day was there, and I just told him, I said, let's pick up all the dead brush and limbs around here, and let's make a brush pile right on that corner. And we did, and we made it where the deer had to now go around that brush pile and when they did, as they circled around, they were broadside and quartered away before they went out to the field. And a lot of times they would stop there, you know, just before they would enter the open ag field. But those little things like that, tweaking little things like that or, or trying it, you know, it was an idea I had looking at the situation. And since then, years ago, it's been 20 or 30 years ago, there's times I use that to my favor. You know, if it's just dragging a few dead limbs down and piling them up against a live tree and making it making an obstacle for them to have to walk around. Sometimes that's all you need to get that better shot angle. I, I also have a tip too, uh, in regard to the one thing uh, I've, I've been, I've always found to be the case is that no matter what you plan for, when you start putting seed in the ground, depending on how much rain you get, depending on deer browse, a lot of different things, usually the green plots that I plant in the fall, I'll re I'll, I'll literally mow and replant certain areas. Like let's say a bean field. If I have an acre of beans and, and the corner, one corner of it got completely hammered or, um, and it can be either corn or beans. I have to, I actually have a, a, a piece of property that I lease from a farmer and he, he leaves some standing corn in one of the areas and the back of this field is absolutely mowed down to the ground come uh, August. So that's when I go in and I literally will cut down, you know, half stalks of corn, beans that are just completely destroyed and I'll, I'll just retill it. So if, if your spring plots don't come in great, you still have another shot come fall. And that's when I plant my harvest salad and, and I'm kind of lazy anymore. I used to plant all the different varieties. Now I just plant harvest salad with the plot topper and that does everything I want. Um, and the deer just absolutely love it from, Oh, as soon as it starts coming out of the ground until even, you know, this time of year, they're feeding on something throughout the entire hunting season. It's, it's been my go-to. That's all. I, that's what I plant now. I just, I love it. I know it. And it, it seems to grow extremely well in a variety of different locations too. out, uh, you know, in broad open, wide open field to some back corners and different, different areas that, um, uh, you know, I think that's just your advantage of planting multiple seasons in one spot is that, you've got 12 different seeds that have an opportunity to grow. Some of them might thrive, some of them might not as much, but you just, you're upping your odds for, for food throughout the year for your animals, period. You know, another thing I'm looking at, and I know Todd, I've seen some pictures with you is, you know, everybody's out shed hunting now looking for their sheds. And, you know, you, you look in adjacent where those sheds you're finding. I mean, we've got one property that we just, we checked one food plot in one corner and, you know, there's five sheds in that food plot. You know, and it's not a very big food plot. It's probably an acre and a half is probably all it is. But there's there's a ridge, there's cover close by. But 
keeping that in mind next year, there's one buck in there that if he'd make it maybe another year, maybe two years, he'd definitely be something to go after. But, you know, knowing that is knowing that, okay, in a couple of years, if we have the same scenario and we can't get on that deer early, late season, his sheds was there. He was on this property feeding in that plot in that area on the same product. So late season, it might be a good chance to get on that same deer if he does the same thing for a few years in a row. But those sheds you're finding in adjacent or two or, you know, most of the time they're in cover or trails. But when you find them in a food source, that definitely tells you they're spending a lot of time there right at the end of season. So if you can catch them there the last few weeks of season, you know, when, when they're really coming, the stomachs are driving them to where they're going to, to feed. You know, there's the stomachs, stomachs the king for those deer at the late season. And you get in there on a last week or two cold hunt, sometimes that's the time to get them big deer. It sure is. I know this past season there was a bunch of deer that died on that uh, that cold front, man. I mean, it was just like one of those epic years, and you wait for it with beans. Um, and I actually killed uh, Katie's buck over some real world beans uh, late season. So I know they work, man. I've killed so many big bucks now over over your plots and adjacent to your plots and some of these thick bedding areas and stuff like that. And that's you know another thing. I think when we all start getting into food plots, we get nuts and we hunt food plots, hunt on the edges of these food plots on ground blinds and all that. And for a period of time, it's so exciting and fun because you can sit there. It's easy to film out of them. Uh, you see a ton of deer. It, it's just enjoyable. And there's something cool about watching animals feed and thrive on the, the seed that you planted and, and the work that you put into your farm. So that's all, that's all well and good. But I also, as a bow hunter, uh, especially self-filming, I realized it's a challenge to self-film on a, on, a, on a food plot out of a ground blind. Just the deer, the big ones just don't stop moving very often. And by the time you get everything aligned and you know the distance, it's like, but it seems like it just, it's it's challenging to control. So I have on all of my best kill plots, I've got stands now, sometimes within 15 yards of my kill plots that I can't even hunt in. I can't even get a shot in my kill plot, but I know with certain winds, certain times of year during the rut, where these does bed and where the bucks will be cruising. And that's where I killed Walter Payton was literally probably 40 or 50 yards from a real world uh, plot. But I just, I knew where I could get them at close bow range and it was not on that food plot. So, but I, you still use the same tactic of using that green plot. It's not only a food source during the rut, but it's a social networking area. And that's where all the deer come to, f- to find out what does are around, what does are hot and what other bucks are in the area. It's just, it's like the corner, the corner bar. Um, so it goes far beyond food during the season. And especially if, if there's no other good green food source around during the rut, those places have become my favorite. And so now I'm just, I figured out what works and now I'm just trying to duplicate that in as many areas as I can on my farm um, and on adjacent farms just to create those same scenarios. Cause once you realize something works, there's no need to reinvent the wheel. Yep. Kevin, what's the, what's the biggest mistake that you see land managers, landowners, you know, people that are, that are putting food plots in, what's the biggest mistake that you see them making? I would say that's probably two of them pretty close. One of them for sure is soil test. You know, every, everybody wants to do a food plot, but I would tell you probably out of everybody that plants food plots, probably one or two out of every 10 ever has done a soil test. And, you know, the th- the way I look at it is this, is you can go out there and throw some seed on the ground, it comes up and you think, boy, I had a good plot, you know, the deer ate in it, they done good. But if each of them plants didn't have a chance to reach the full potential, did you have enough food for all year? Did the palatability of your plants cha- change? You know, some guys will say, well, you know, I planted it and I seen some deer, they only ate in it at a certain time. Well, maybe because when the plant started getting stressed because it didn't have enough uh, nutrients in there, maybe it's low on potash or something, the plant starts to stress and starts to turn yellow, then there's a reason because it doesn't taste as good. So that soil test is key, and and I stress it to everybody all the time. You know, it's simply, you can do it very simple. You can you can check in a lot of places around you. If you got farmers or fertilizer people around you, they can direct you how to get a soil test, 8 to 10 to 20 bucks. You know, it's less than cost of, of half of uh, doing an acre of seed. It's less than the cost of that, but it'll be the biggest difference in your food plot. The other thing I see is, you know, when, when guys go by, I uh, see guys that have a, a picture of a truckload of seed they bought on sale that was, you know, they spent $200 on this truckload of seed. 
And, and I tell them, I said, you know, it, it looks good, but flip it over. Let's look at the tags. And they look at the tags and it may say, you know, whatever the percentage of germ is, say it's 70 or 80% germ, but the tag's three years old. So, you know, the reason it should have been retagged or, or taken off the shelves, the reason it's being sold at such a discount is because that germ that was 80% three years ago is probably way below 40 or 50%, you know, depending on the quality of the seed and kind of how it's done. So when guys are thinking they're getting a good deal buying seed that was being sold for, you know, $40 a bag and they're buying it for $5 a bag that day and they buy everything on the shelf, they need to need to read the seed tags. At least check the test dates, make sure it's current within the last year or so, and then the germ on them, you know, to make sure they're getting good quality seed, whatever seed they buy. Those are two key things in getting a successful food plot is nutrients in the soil and, and at least a quality seed to put in the ground. I, I know we went over it with, with Don, um, and I don't remember if we went over it in our show with you, and, and um, I think Don may have even been last year. I, they, I don't remember, but what what exactly is um, – you mentioned the, the tag, and I, I know what the tag is means but uh what's the the most important pieces of information on that tag well when it comes to any any seed that we're looking about planting as far as seed the first thing we want to look at is the percentages of this actual seed that's in the bag so or or, you know we're looking at the variety we're wanting to buy so if you're looking at clover say you know you look at the different clover blends now as a farmer and we look back to the farmer's science because they spent billions of dollars to know how to grow these products the best you know, us food plotters can can learn a lot by kind of how they do things. But, you know, when a farmer is wanting to plant clover or alfalfa or something like that, if they're putting, you know, 10 to 20 pounds per acre on a plot to harvest the seed for sale, they only use maybe, you know, 2 to 5% or so inoculant or coating on that seed, even though they've got fertilizer and everything down. They don't use very much inoculant or coating to get that seed to grow. They want to plant more seed. And when you look at most blends, you can start right there and kind of eliminate, you know, or look about, you know, ones that are 30 to 40 or 50 percent coating or collaring in the bag. It tells you right on the tag. I mean, whether it's a seed or whether it's inert matter, meaning inoculant, or it could be a powder collared coating coating that they use or or other stuff. The one other thing I might say is when when you look on seed tags, you'll always see something that says other crop seed or weed seed. Um, certified inspectors at any time can come and pull any samples or any bags off the shelf and have them inspected. So just to give you an example, like on ours, it may say a 0.05% weed seed. Now that doesn't mean we put weed seed in there. What it means is, is we mix, mix the seed in totes and, and blenders and, and, uh, actually, you know, comes out of totes. So if that tote before had say wheat, or oats in it and one one grain stuck in the corner of that and comes out in a bag of this mix we have to put some number on there so ours is like 0.5 or 0.50 in case there would be another seed found in that bag that we're not going to stop sale on that and most companies that's what it's on there for is on other seed or weed seed that's what it's a, a small amount of percentage if it's very much then it could be another crop seed that's being added but that most of the seeds in there, but it's simple math when you really figure it up. You know, if 100% of that bag is 10 pounds, then you just start looking up the percentages and add them up. When you're done, take what it does not say it's as a seed, take that part out of the equation and subtract it from the pounds you bought and see how many pounds of actual seed you really bought. That's what and it gets I, to on, on kind of reading. And, I wanna, I, and after, we, after I got to know Kevin and, and Don and, and learned more and more and more, if you go to your typical hunting store and you look at, especially the, it seems like the smaller bags of some of the big name brands, and you look at the back of the seed uh, percentage, you'd be shocked to see somehow, in some way, shape, or form, how much truly is filler. It's it's amazing, but it's just the way it is. And it seems like a lot of the smaller bags have have even more so uh, filler, and they they claim it's uh, coating and and um, and fertilizer. But it's basically the difference between getting 100% ground venison or having them add 50% soy to it. I, I mean, like yeah. that's it, it is truly they're basically taking up that space in the bag like air in a bag of potato chips. Well, and the thing is, you know, inoculant most generally is a gray collar, kind of a light gray collar. So 
when when you find some where you where you dump a bag out and then at the bottom your hands are all blue or there's blue powder comes out or yellow or green powder, you know that's that's coloring is what that is. That's not a seed. It's just to change that coating. You know, it's the same inoculum. Everybody, if they're using inoculum on a seed, which most generally they just use it on clover seeds. Clovers and chicories is about the only ones that, you know, when you when you buy a bag of an oats or a wheat blend, you don't see on there that they put 30 or 50 percent inoculum on that. You know, I mean, those seeds don't need it. You know, the wheat and oats and them, they'll pretty well grow anywhere. So when you get to, uh, you know, clovers, chicories, alfalfas, those seeds, if the soil is not really good or somebody's not done a soil test it kind of helps jump start that seed and gives a little bit of nutrition right there by the seed for a little bit but you know like i said a farmer knows he only needs you know two to five percent on 10 pounds you know so he just needs a little bit he doesn't need on 10 pounds of seed he doesn't need five pounds of inoculum you know you can only get so much to stick to that seed and then what you pour out in the bottom is the powder and you paid for it but you really does you no good so I'm looking at uh, one, Jay, one. I'm picking up. I'm picking up a lot of your paper noise, Jason. I don't know if that's something you can edit out later. That's no, it's not because I have a bag of uh, clover in my hand. Um, oh, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I've got a. He's planting seed while we're talking. That's what. He's right. Doing. Well, <laughs> I like it. I, so I've got this new lease, and um, you know, I want to get it right. Uh, and so I've got, I believe, fifty pounds of clover and chicory. And uh, I was just comparing yours with uh, a bag that I had of um, of one of your competitors from just recently uh, because the the guy uh, that I'm going to plant this seed with ha- happened to have it, and I was just I'm yep. I'm really surprised that um, that there's that much difference, but there really is. I'm I'm looking at uh, at yours, and I'd say somewhere just north or just south of six to seven percent of of what you have in your bag isn't chicory or clover is that accurate yeah. am i reading that ours correct is, yeah ours is right ours is 6.55 percent six percent is the inert matter of the coating the inoculant 0.05 is what could be a weed seed it's just a precaution that it could be 0.50 is could be another crop seed. So it's 6.55% on a 10 pound bag, which I think leaves you like 9.3 or some like 9.3 something pounds of actual seed in a 10 pound bag is the way that converts. And like I say, there's some that sell seven or eight pounds per acre. And if you read on the tags, they'll tell you, and, it, and it's legal. That's the thing about it. It's legal because it's up to you to read the tag. Right. But they'll tell you on the tag they're putting 50% of something that's not seed. So uh-huh. the same acre you're planting with a competitor might only be three or three and a half or four pounds of actual seed. But, you know, that's why, that's why we started our company with the Dare to Compare motto because we knew if we were building the products right, it's pretty easy for us to say, plant our clover chicory blend on a one acre plot next to a one acre plot of something else on the market. And if you're planting, you know, 9.3 pounds of our seed and three pounds of somebody else's seed, it's easy to see at the end of the year. You know, most of them's not that drastic. Most of them are at least five pounds, five and a half pounds of seed per acre. But that's the big difference is, you know, we're three to four pounds more seed. But but on a dare to compare, you'll obviously see the results pretty easily. Yeah, I I, I definitely like. I'm looking at this other bag here, and um, I'd say it's somewhere around 55 percent of what is on or what's said to be on the front of the bag is actually in the bag. So um, that's yeah. it, that's and that's also why um, it's not going to grow as well and and all those other things. Um, Todd, do you have anything else? I've I've got one more question that just came in. I I, I do too. I, there's one. Uh, there was one about uh, the effectiveness or attractiveness of brassicas because I think everybody saw uh, Doctor Deer's comment this morning or whatever about uh, I don't know something about uh, brassicas not working or or being a, an overrated food plot um, seed, and I can only speak from my experience and everybody I know, but I don't think I would plant my I don't, I, I don't plant just brassicas. I plant my mix and I watch them hit everything in those plots and including brassicas. Um, but because there's so much grain in my area and because I plant so much grain, 
they're not forced to feed on the, the bulbs themselves or the turnips themselves uh, during the winter. They will sometimes, sometimes they don't. Some plots they will, some t- plots they don't. But I think they work at, an incredibly well as a uh, as a green food source because they seem to really, really love the tops. And um, and so that, that's a, a one big topic for conversation. But do you think they're any more effective in the north versus the south, Kevin? Uh. I think in the South, it, it, I, there's there's four key things. I've, I've got a blog wrote up. I'm going to post it here shortly, but I'm also going to try to tie it in with some footage showing deer feeding in them in the first week of October, deer feeding in them, you know, mid-season, December, deer digging them up underneath the snow. And I'm going to show a picture where like a, a doe actually reaches down and grabs a leaf underneath the snow and pulls it up. And you can tell she chews on a little bit and drops it. She didn't <laughs> like the taste of that one. Maybe it, maybe it started to mature. Maybe it was too far along. But, you know, she can't see any of this product or any of the snow. She reaches down and grabs the next leaf, and she eats it all. So the, the blog's going to detail a lot of this stuff, and I will, I will tell you this much. We tested probably somewhere between 75 to 80 varieties from turnips, radishes, kales, carrots, products called Ethiopian cabbage, and everything else. I mean, anything I could get that had a brassica name to it, we tried them in side-by-side tests to see what deer would eat and see why they ate some and didn't eat others. Some of them don't have to have a frost. They don't have to have a cold weather. It, it depends on the maturity. But it goes back to some key things. Nutrients in the soil. If you have high nitrate in your soil, those plants can draw more nitrate in the leaves, which makes them bitter. Um, one of the things I will say is uh, some misconceptions are is that the deer have to get used to them. And I tell people this. When the snow's on the ground, they're eating twigs. <clears throat> they don't have to get used to eating something. It just can't taste bad to them. It's got to taste good. So in the Nebraska world, there's some, like a purple top turnip, that needs five to seven days of below 32 degrees when it's at a certain maturity level. Meaning if you planted it in July and you get the cold weather in, in November, that plant may already be starting to decay. You may have planted it too early. If you're planting it, you know, September, and you get your frost or get your colder weather, you know, December or so, like my area, you know, maybe December or January before I start getting cold weather, that purple top turnip comes in late, late season for me. But then you got like sugar beets and tillage radishes and other ones that the nitrate's never really high in those. As those plants mature, even if they don't get cold weather, they still become desirable to the deer. So there's a big misconception in the whole market of brassicas that started years ago with planting them, they get a frost, they turn sweet, deer love them. And then there's been so many of them that's been used that do not fall in that category. And it's kind of made people where they either love them or hate them. You know, they've either seen good success with them or they have not. And, you know, there's a lot of thoughts, theories, and ideas about it. And I hope to, when I post this blog and some video clips, to kind of Perfect. help give some people some things to think about on it. But, yeah, I mean, where, where you know, Dr. Deer had posted that, I mean, that's like I, I made a comment on there that there's some varieties I've seen that the deer won't eat, and there's other ones that they do. So it depends on the varieties and how much testing the guy's done. But, you know, we just spent years and years, and and our whole testing phase is based on what deer will eat, not based on anything else, but based on what deer eat, and that's how we put blends together. So, the, like the plot topper blend, you know, for guys that have never have either planted brassicas, either been good for them or bad for them, you know, it's a half acre jug, and I recommend guys doing side by side tests, and you know, try something that they they got that works really well for them, and plant a little bit beside it, or. If they planted brassicas before and they didn't work, they might want to try a little bit of jug, and it's got some different varieties in there that that turn at different times and are attractive all the way through hunting season. So, I can I can speak from experience. One one of the uh, the most ex- I don't know to me it's very interesting is when you're sitting over. And because I've hunted over the deadly dozen so much, I'm such a huge fan of it. I, I enjoy watching deer at different times of the year and how fussy they seem to be when food is plentiful. And you'll watch a doe or a buck or whatever sitting sitting out in front of your blind and they'll feed for, you know, anywhere between uh, five minutes to an hour. And some deer will literally come into that field and just sniff around, sniff around, find one plant, eat it. Sniff around, sniff around, sniff around, find one plant, eat it. The other ones are like pigs and they just want to eat everything. And one of my most enjoyable um, hunts from this past season was I was actually already tagged out and I had a big shooter come out onto one of your plots. It was a deadly dozen plot and I watched him and it was late rut um, just before gun season opened here. And I watched him come out and pig out in one of your fields for like probably 20 minutes. And he was pulling whole turnips right out of the ground. And, and I plant, I tend to plant my turnips a little bit later uh, in August, mid August. 
And he was pulling the whole plant out of the ground and eating from the bulb all the way to the tops of the leaves. And as he was eating it, it was like just rotating like a fan out of his mouth, just just <laughs> pig. And I mean, just pig and out gorging. And I mean, like you, I was waiting for him to freaking choke. But it was amazing to me. You could just you could read his body language that he was literally just starving to death and wanted to eat as much food as humanly possible in the shortest period of time. And it was just, he was devouring it and about as much fun as I have it as, as a Chinese buffet, pretty much. Um, yeah. but, you know, and, and I've been watching this now for five or six years. I've been playing her stuff. So I've watched it. Uh, I've evolved with it and watched the deer evolve with it. And I've just, I'm just a huge fan of that deadly dozen. I, I don't think you can screw it up. And until you get to the point where you've got a lot of equipment and a lot of ground to work with, generally guys don't have, you know, 50 kill plots or something like that. And I think I got up to like 22 last year or something. And I'm going to probably even downsize from that just because I don't need them anymore. I'm starting to learn more and more about where I need them, where I don't need them, where I want to let some native grasses coming back. Um, and, and try to create multiple version or multiple varieties of cover and, and everything in between uh, on my property. And that brings us to another huge hot topic the last couple of weeks. And I've had a bunch of people ask me about it is this burning. When you, when people go out and you, and you burn your fields, a lot of it uh, generally is done in CRP switchgrass areas. Is that the only application or time that you see uh, the need to burn anything, Kevin, is when you're strictly doing CRP or switchgrass type uh, native grasses? Yeah, and the, and the thing of it is, is what you're doing with those native grasses is benefiting them. You're actually burning the uh, any weeds or weed seed. A lot of them won't take a fire, so you're trying to keep it clean. Uh, small trees that start to grow in there, it burns the cambium layer, which holds the sap in, so it eliminates most trees from surviving a fire. And then the native grass plant, what happens is, is you know, it grows a big plant. You After about every two or three years, you burn that the top of it off. Well, the root base is a great big old root base. It may be six or seven feet in the ground. So when that plant starts to green up and grow, when the ground temperature hits 60 degrees, you know, middle of May or so, that plant accelerates its growth, and it's always going to grow back taller and thicker than it was before after a burn. That was always my concern when I first started burning off my first CRP field back in 1986 or 87. I was scared to death. After two years of growth, I finally got something going here, and I was scared to death I was going to have nothing the next year. And after I burned it, it came in twice as thick and twice as tall. But, yeah, those fires are the best way to maintain native grasses. It's like mowing your yard once a week in the summertime or walking away and not mowing for a year and coming back and seeing what you got. You know, I mean, it's going to keep them clean and keep them thick and keep them growing. Interesting. That's the only plot I really do any burning in. I mean, most of my bean stubble fields and stuff, I'll bush hog the stalks and work that debris into the soil. I really don't want to burn it up. I want to add that, you know, that kind of organic matter or break that up to go back into the soil, help keep my soil from getting compaction. So. No, I, I think uh, people see these big, these burn videos on YouTube and stuff. And, it, and I, I do too on Facebook and it's very impressive. And it's like, holy cow. Uh, and, and so it's been a hot topic for discussion and that's honestly when, uh, when Don and, and Kevin came to my place a few years ago, that was one of my big things I was kind of considering doing was putting switchgrass in some of my areas. And after they kind of filled me in, I'm like, okay, so basically in order to have a really nice looking switchgrass field or CRP field, you got to be able to burn it, uh, regularly. Um, now is that something typically they do, you do yearly, um, uh, Kevin, or is that like a multi every other year or uh, yeah, nor normally, like, you you plant the first year, you let it go for a couple of years. If you don't have any uh, weed competition, you let it go to about the third year, and then you burn it off the third okay. year, and then every two to three years after that, you want to burn it off, because that way, if you have some small trees get started in there, by the time they're a two-year-old plant, you can still burn them off and maintain them. Um, one of my farms, what I do is, is it, it's kind of a draw, sticks out in the middle of the field, and it was just a little bit brushy draw, didn't have a lot of thick cover in it, but I... I went through and actually just kind of burned everything off in it. And then I took uh, five acres of a cattle pasture out of old fescue grass and started spraying it and killing it. And then I no-tilled the bay and bag in all that area, even in that draw and all the way down through there. So now it sticks out into my crop field. So every year we have bean stubble. It's easier for me to control a burn when I have bean stubble now. So I burn it every other year when we're doing beans. And when we do corn stalks, I don't burn it on that year because it's a no-till farm. So we leave the crop residue on the field. So okay. it's easier to control it. 
No, typically when you're when you're planting switchgrass and native grasses, you you pretty much need to drill all those, do you not? Uh, except for the switchgrass. If a guy's doing switchgrass, it's a little bitty round hard seed, a lot like a clover alfalfa seed. So okay. uh, a good way to plant it is in the fall, if a guy's getting a plot ready, you know, if he's got an area he wants to put in switchgrass, uh, he can either, you know, get it prepared and put it in oats and then frost seed the switchgrass into it and have a food source and still have the cover to come on next spring. Using the oats as basically a weed control, kind of a cover crop weed control for next spring or you know, a guy can get that area worked up and sprayed and killed. And then, you know, middle of February or first of February, that time frame, maybe even into March, uh, frost seeded switchgrass over the top. And then when it starts to warm up, you know, the key is, is it's just controlling those weeds. So if it's a pretty clean plot and he sprays uh, aprazine, which is a residual on the soil over that uh, soil, it actually suppresses unwanted weed and grass growth and it has no effect on switchgrass. So, that keeps it clean where the switchgrass gets up and gets a chance to start before other stuff competition comes in. But that's, I mean, other than that, no-tills, I mean, you can always no-till either product, but as far as frost seeding, the the best fit for that is switchgrass, but the best fit for uh, frost seeding is to prepare that plot in advance the fall before. So when it gets to be frost seeding time, the plot's clean, cleared up and ready to go. Oh, and I, I know one thing. The before you get excited about planting switchgrass, look at the cost of seed. Uh, it's not cheap to plant, um, and it does take some extra time. For that reason, I've not um, I've not planted any switchgrass on my farm, even though I'd love to. I mean, everything you've got to check and balance, and I have to uh, watch my costs on everything, just like anybody. Um, so it just hasn't been a huge uh, priority of mine. But uh, CRP switchgrass to get it to look the way you you see it, and you know you envision the seven foot tall switchgrass so thick you can't even walk through it. That's going to take some time, man. That's not something you do overnight. Yeah. It take it takes two or three years of doing the proper process to get it to that point. And then after that, you know, it's a perennial. So, like I say, my first plot I planted back in 1986, it's still growing fine. I, after I seed it at once, I don't need to reseed it. All I have to do is maintain it every year, and it still does fine. So there you go. If you want to burn something, go burn your farm down or your neighbors. Just don't make sure we uh, <laughs> catch the blame for it. <laughs> I, I I thought about that the other day. I'm like I'm watching these videos and some of our um, uh, some of our, our one of our sponsors, Land Pros. Some of the agents are out doing a lot of big work for some of their their clients and stuff. And I'm watching these fires, and I'm like thinking to myself, I don't think I would, ha- I wouldn't sleep for a week leading up to it, and probably be out there till two o'clock in the morning, making sure it didn't continue to burn. I'd be so paranoid about it. <laughs> so I don't think it's something that uh, the average Joe wants to just get into. You want to definitely get some people involved who uh, have done it before, have some experience with it uh, before you start uh, dumping gasoline on your food plots. Yeah, one one thing I always do, and I learned years ago, the first thing you want to do is call the fire department. Let them know you're going to be doing a burn because I warned some neighbors one year, but yet the uh, somebody driving by seen my fire, and they called the fire department in. So anymore, I've I realized you got to call a fire department. Let them know you're doing a burn. Keep their number at the top of your speed dial list in case you do need them. And then, you know, you, you pick it on a day where it's not so windy and you actually you start doing a back burn on most of these. You start at the end that the wind's going to blow the fire too. You start little fires there and put them out to kind of burn up some of the, the fuel being the stalks or the dead stems, kind of get it burning back away from your, you know, hopefully you got a clover strip or a green, a green product around the edge, but you burn it back a ways. And then once you get it to where the fire can't jump your fire break, you go to the other end and set it a fire. And that's what most people see is, just a tremendous blaze going out across the field, but there was a lot of preparation that took place ahead of time, hopefully, to keep that fire from jumping or getting out of control. I, I can just imagine doing all this and listening to Metallica just full blast the whole time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, Todd, you never cease to amaze us. So doesn't it just sound like it, though? I'm like, oh, my Lord, that's just that'd be the only reason I really want to do it is just listen to Metallica while I do it. <laughs> All right, one one last question, Kevin, and then we'll let you uh, let you go do uh, on to some more important tasks. But uh, um, one of uh, one of the folks wrote in here while we were recording this: um, How important is coating your seed with an after? They called it an aftermarket product. 
prior to putting it in the ground like uh I, I, there's all kinds of i don't know um any name brands i guess i do know name brands i won't mention any um but there's seed coat that they recommend you putting on your seed prior to putting it in the ground is that anything that you think is important well i, I go back to the same thing if you're trying to find a shortcut not to do a soil test m- maybe some of those products work but i always tell people the same thing uh if, if you're needing it or if you think you need it plant treat half your seed and put it on your plot and not treat the other half your seed and see a difference. I've tried a lot of foliage sprays and treatments from, from as far as I took a 10 acre field, planted all the same seed all the same time. We sprayed it on the ground. We treated the seed. When the plants first come up, we sprayed it. When the plants got up, you know, almost knee high and we sprayed Roundup over a bean field, we sprayed it again. I actually treated that field five times, five acres of it, and was comparing foliage tests from one side to the other. Now, when it comes to that, you know, I had guys tell me, you know, this is the numbers, this is what all it'll do. And for me, anyway, I did not see the results. I know farmers, I know the guy, one of the guys that farmed for me, he does some foliage spray because he's looking at one or two bushel to the yield more on crops where he does it at. Where, you know, as far as uh, benefiting the seed as adding – seed treatments and stuff. I don't know all the science behind it. I just know there's not a shortcut from a soil test and adding what you need in the soil and, and trying to get a cheaper way or a quicker way or easy way to do it is not necessarily the best way. So I don't, I don't know, I mean, how, how well that works on poor soil because I've always been one to do a soil test and add a little bit above and beyond what's recommended to know that my seeds, once they sprout, I, they've got everything in the soil they need. So I'm not probably an expert in that field as far as all the different ones because I haven't tried them and I don't know all the benefits that I could say work or don't work. But I have tried probably six or seven different type of foliage sprays and, and seed treatment, you know, things in the past. In the past probably, you know, it's probably been three or four years since I've done any, but I've done them for four or five years in a row trying to find out if there was a big enough difference to show a value to food plotters that would work or not. Uh, here's my here's my take on it. I think a lot of a lot of the uh, the small small seed in a bag that you buy at the big big box stores. I think some of those seed companies have really promoted the fact that they use some sort of a special seed coating or whatever. I, you, you shouldn't be buying your seed for the coating, based on my experience. And what I did on my plots is I started to notice when I when I was planting fertilizer. I didn't have a very consistent way of doing it. And and so I'd spill fertilizer. Some areas would get more than others. And then come hunting season, when you're sitting in your blind, you're looking at your food plot, you have nothing to do but sit there and look at it and analyze it. And there was areas that had twice as much growth where you could clearly see I'd, I had accidentally spilled fertilizer right there. Um, and I used just a 62424, I believe. Does that sound right, Kevin? That's a non-nitrogen... Yep. Okay. And so that's what I get from my local, my co-op. And I think it's like 11 bucks for a 50 pound bag. So now when I'm planting my food plots, I've been putting an extra couple bags on per acre each year, just because for the added cost, I see the benefit. And I've, and I've seen it so many years now where I just, I spend the extra 20 bucks, 30 bucks or whatever for a, a one acre plot. And how I've been applying my fertilizer now is I've been, uh, when I do my last step, which is cult packing, that's when I'm spreading my fertilizer. And I've got the perfect settings on my spreader where I'm getting a perfect consistent feed of fertilizer on my food plot um, so that I don't have super green areas that grew a foot tall and then other areas that, you know, barely grew at all. So I think your consistency of your fertilizer, but, you know, a 624-24, you don't need any nitrogen for most of these green plots, at least for my f- soil around here, we have pretty good general soil here in Iowa. Um, that's pretty, got a good amount of nitrogen in it. And, and I think a lot of it too, Kevin, doesn't it have to do with, if you're planting a lot of corn, corn just strips your, your soils from nitrogen. So if you're, you know, going into a corn field or an area that's been planting corn year after year after year, that would be an area you'd really have to do a little bit better job of, um, of soil toss and things like that. Is that not correct yeah that's that's true yep and your beans are producing nitrogen your legumes are producing nitrogen so you know i mean you're building a soil with some plants that you use but but one thing kind of like what you touched on there is one thing i'll tell guys is you know when it comes to food plotters or it comes to farmers you know just use some common sense if it worked that well for for us guys that that's marketed to in food plots maybe the farmers would be using it too you know if it benefited our seed enough in food plots Every farmer is looking for the next edge to get two more bushel to the acre yield. 
you know, and, and those guys would be all over stuff. The same way when it comes to, like, us working with the deer farmers, you know, the we just got back from the D- Nadipa show, the National Deer and Elk Conference, meeting with some of the biggest deer breeders there is, you know, about our mineral and our, our feed additives, the Expect Healthy Deer Technology, the whitetail-specific probiotics we got, meeting with major some of the major and top feed companies in the United States, you know, about our products. So look into it, you know, when you're looking about what mineral or what feed or what you're using, are there deer farmers that are using it? Because every inch of antlers is dollars for them, you know. They're, they're not going to get fooled. The old saying I always got is you're not going to fool a farmer, whether it's crops, spray chemicals or you know deer farmers in nutrition salt mineral whatever it is those guys can't be fooled because they know the science behind it whether it's you know a, a seed in the ground or whether it's you know uh, nutrition for an animal a lot of smoke and mirrors in the old hunting industry <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know, and always always try you know do side by side tests whether it's minerals seeds uh seed or whatever do your own testing don't you know don't take anybody's word for it for sure prove it to yourself and and see what kind of results you get from it you know that's what it is it's about your confidence in the products or the confidence you plant and the results you see so now i I, just one last closing comment is every year every year i learn and i make mistakes and i learn lessons and I think that's the that's the one nice thing about having multiple plots is that you can always have that a little bit of um, uh, curiosity or testing phase. Um, so don't even if you have a failed plot, you didn't fail. You just learn more, uh, learn what you're not going to do next time. So I've um, I've learned last year. My lesson was don't try broadcasting corn. It ain't going to work. Um, and I believe uh, someone told you beans. that on Facebook. Oh, I, for sure. But it was one of those things I've always wanted to do. So I, I tried it and I had some different areas that, uh, to be 100% honest with you, it didn't really matter. Um, and so I've got enough areas now where I can kind of spread out and, and have some test plots each year and stuff like that. But I think I think the, the guys who um, are just getting into it, green plots are really easy. Beans are really easy. Uh, and if you have any specific questions beyond this, please feel free to either uh, you can private message to myself directly, white knuckle page, uh, or go right on the post from uh, Kevin's uh, podcast uh, that we made announcements and had different questions and stuff. And feel free to ask some questions. I know um, that we there's nothing more than we like to do than help other guys uh, and girls achieve success in the field. And this is just one of our huge tools for success. So thank you again, uh, Kevin, um, for your guys' support of White Knuckle Productions. Uh, I know there's one thing, there's no other seed that I will plant. So you're stuck with us. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. Good time talking to you guys. Well, there you have it. Our interview with Kevin Boyer from Real World Wildlife Products. If you have any questions for Kevin, don't be afraid to email him. His email is on their website, realworldwildlifeproducts.com. I will put links to their website in our show notes. So if you have any questions, you're able to uh, you're able to get them addressed by Kevin or whomever it is that you're looking to talk to over there. If you want to email Todd or myself, again, it's Jason at whitenuckleproductions.com or Todd at whitenuckleproductions.com. You're welcome to email us any questions that you have and we can get them over to Kevin and specifically get them answered for you. If you have a uh, you know, a really specific question, do not be afraid to ask. They would be more than happy to help you. If there's one thing that you take away from these shows that we've done with real world wildlife products, and look, I understand that that, that they're our partner and, and you all probably think that there's uh, that's the only reason that we have them on. It's not. There's va- They weren't our partner last year. Um, there's value in what they have to say uh, and there's value in the knowledge that can be um, garnered from all the stuff that they're sharing with us. Uh, They're just a wealth of knowledge, whether it's Kevin, whether it's Don, whether it's Terry, whether it's Aaron Gaines, any of those folks. um, When we have them on, you definitely should take time to listen to the whole thing because there's a wealth of knowledge there and they can absolutely make a difference in your hunt for the coming year. So with that, we will close out the show for today. Thanks again for listening. Jason out. Wait, there's one more thing. I would be filled with regret if I did not tell you that if you haven't figured it out by now, Ozonix is manufacturer to consumer only. They're not in any retail stores. So the only way you can buy their product if you haven't caught up with them at one of the trade shows this year or don't plan to, 
Um, the only way you're going to be able to buy that product is to go to www.ozonicshunting.com. Now, if you want the special white knuckle deal, it's www.ozonicshunting.com backslash WKP. Um, you can just go to that site, which is a site within their site, and you'll get the deal of the month that White Knuckle is putting on in tandem or in in partnership with White, or excuse me, with uh, Ozonic. So um, now I will officially end the show. Thanks again for listening.